We believe and confess one single Catholic or universal church, a holy congregation and gathering of true believers awaiting their entire salvation in Jesus Christ, being washed by his blood and sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. This church has existed from the beginning of the world and will last until the end, as appears from the fact that Christ is eternal King who cannot be without subjects. And his holy church is preserved by God against the rage of the whole world, even though for a time it may appear very small in the eyes of men, as though it were snuffed out. For example, during the very dangerous days of Ahab, the Lord preserved for himself 7,000 men who did not bend their knees to Baal. And so this holy church is not confound or confined, bound or limited to a certain place or certain persons, but it is spread and dispersed throughout the entire world, though still joined and united in heart and will, in one and the same spirit, by the power of faith. Um, reading from Revelations 5, verses 1 to 10. <coughs> then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of insects incense which are the prayers of the saints and they sang a new song you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth you haven't noticed already you can see our new artworks up taken more than a year but we got there <laughs> so um, thanks to, to Dave who came down yesterday uh, and helped me put it up um, a lot of people uh, involved in that the, the 100 um, children who put together the 200 feathers and then of course the teacher who organized it all Claire and then um, you had Jenny Dyster and Margaret Farland who put all the feathers together um, on the onto the um, the board um, using the design of Claire the teacher. Um, and then I did the frame and then um, Doug Basham in his truck helped me get it down here last week <laughs> and then Dave McFarlane helped me put it up. So quite a few people involved in this little project. But um, um, the, the idea of the teacher, of course, was that th the children symbolically would be with us in worship um, and a reminder of the children as we worship uh, as well. So isn't that beautiful? Um, so we've got our own little piece of artwork uh, here in, in our church. So that's, that's great. So I'm really thrilled that we finally got it up. Well, I'm sure we've uh, all heard of the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. Anyone not heard of that? <laughs> I'm sure all but one, but most of us have heard of uh, don't judge a book by its cover. That, also, that has to do with perceptions, doesn't it? How we see things. And how we see things uh, often can mean that what we see and what we think we see isn't real. It's way off the mark. It's quite possible, of course, our, perception, our, our perception is accurate, but quite often our perceptions are completely wrong. It's just our interpretation of what we see that can have no bearing to what's actually real. There's an ad on TV at the moment, um, 
variations of the same ad, but the one that strikes me in terms of this sermon this morning was this dishevelled fella, fairly thin fella, really long, you know, flowing grey hair, doesn't look particularly well groomed. Um, he really looks like a homeless man. And uh, the whole, whole ad is about the fact that when it comes to insurance companies, they can just put you in a box and don't really think of you as you really are. And so they take you then to the next shot of this fella, and he's sitting in this beautiful house. I mean, beautiful house, and reading a, a magazine or something. And he's an architect, and he's sitting in a house that he's, he's designed and had built. Um, perceptions, just looking at this fella, looking at the book, you know, the cover of the book, you can get a completely different wrong idea of, of what the reality is. So what's our perception of the church? How accurate is our idea of the church? You know, um, if you belong to a mega church, you know what I mean by that? One of these churches that has thousands of members. Uh, some churches have multiple thousands of members, so many so that they have three services on a Sunday in the same building, having three different congregations, as it were. So to get everyone the word and everyone to worship, they have to have multiple services. If you belong to a congregation like that, which, which would feel powerful and vibrant, you'd say the church is strong. Um, the church has a lot of power and a lot of impact and a lot of influence. But what about us? You know, we struggle to get a, 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 a dozen members to, together. And there are churches that meet in homes that are even smaller than us. You know, what's the perception of the church for us? We might think, well, we're just so few. What impact do we have? What power do we have? You know, some would have the idea in a home church that they're barely holding on. If any more people leave town, there'll be no home church. Um, and so they struggle. And church for them is about struggle and about trying to survive. Totally different perception of the church than if you're in a mega church. So we're asking ourselves today that question, what is the church? What is the perception of the church that's biblical? Regardless of whether you belong to a mega church or a little home church, what really is the church? And how should we perceive it in terms of its place in the world and its impact? That's important if you take into account, say, for, for example, what Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18. You know, Jesus was walking uh, with his disciples and he asked them that question, who do people say that I am? And they said, oh, some say, you know, that you're Elijah, some say John the Baptist, one of the prophets, okay? And then Jesus asked that telling question, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter gave that wonderful profession of faith, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, okay? It was in that context that Jesus said to, to Peter, representative of the entire church, that you are Peter and on this rock, that is the rock of Peter's faith, I will build my church church and then he said something important he said and i'll build my church and the gates of hades that is the gates of hell will not overcome it jesus is talking about the church and he says the gates of hell will not overcome it when you look at the confession what did the confession say and this holy church is preserved by god against the rage of the whole world even though for a time it may appear very small in the eyes of men, as though it were snuffed out. So here's this image that Jesus gives, and here's this image that the, the uh, confession gives, a church preserved by God, a church that can't be snuffed out, regardless of all the pressure and all the power of the world standing against it. So how can that be? How is it possible that the church is so enduring? Well, if we're going to really understand the power and the endurance of the church, first of all, we have to see its connection to Jesus. What did the confession say? We believe and confess one single Catholic or universal church, a holy congregation and gathering of true Christians or believers, awaiting their entire salvation in Jesus Christ, being washed by his blood 
and sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus has this gathering of true believers. And whoever they are and wherever they are in the world, these true believers have this in common. They, in, they await their entire salvation, their entire salvation in Jesus. No one and nothing else. I mean, this is something that we've been reminding ourselves every time we worship, don't we? We're not saved by how many times we rock up to church. We're not saved by how many times we read our Bible. We're not saved by what we put into the plate. We're not saved by how many good things we do to our neighbour. We do these things to say thank you because of what Jesus has done for us. But for our salvation entirely, we rest upon Jesus, what he did. Remember on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. What we need for our salvation, he entirely did on the cross. Nothing needs to be added to it. So anything we do is a thank you note. So the church then has this connection with Jesus. It places its entire salvation on him and him alone. And of course, that salvation comes through the washing through his blood. By Jesus dying on the cross for us through the washing of his blood, our sins are taken away. So already in the Psalms it says that God separates our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. In other words, they can't be found, be found back again. You know, one of the problems that uh, you and I can have as Christians is that we go around with a load of guilt upon us, forgetting that when God looks at us, he doesn't see us as we are, but looking us through Jesus... He doesn't see one sin. He has separated them from us as far as the east is from the west. You know, there, there is that sense in which you and I need to learn to live victoriously. We need to live as those who are made perfect, not will be made perfect, but have been made perfect in Jesus Christ. Why? Because we've been washed through his blood. Does that mean that we've got no sins to ask for forgiveness for? Of course not. But we're talking about how God chooses to look upon us in spite of our sins. We still need to ask forgiveness, but the, the reality is God continues to look upon us as though we have never sinned. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that good news? You know, because of that, the Bible talks about the fact that we have confidence to enter into the presence of God. Go and have a look at Hebrews 9 through 11. We have confidence to enter the presence of God through the blood of Jesus. And so this is the connection the church has with Jesus. Places its entire salvation on him because we've been, been washed through his blood. And then it says we've been sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Just think of Pentecost. Through the Spirit, faith is given to us. That's what it says in Ephesians. Faith isn't something we conjure up. In Ephesians 2, it says faith is a gift of God given to us so that nobody can boast. It goes on to say that we are God's workmanship created by God to do good works that he's prepared beforehand for us to do. And so it's the Holy Spirit that's been given so that we are separated, we are called out of the world. So understand this, in Jesus we have our entire salvation and through the Spirit, faith is given to us so that we are separated from the world and we become the people of God. We are the church. So we could say the church are those whom the Holy Spirit has given the gift of faith and from whom he has separated them from the world. That's what Jesus said to the disciples, wasn't it? You are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. The world will hate you because it hated me. So to understand what the church is, we, we have to begin with its connection to Jesus. It's these people who place their entire salvation on Jesus, being washed by his blood, separated through faith by the Holy Spirit from the world. It's of this relationship that Paul speaks when he speaks of the church as being a body. He says that we should speak the truth in love and we will in all things grow up into him who's the head, that is Christ. From him, that's from Jesus, the whole body, that's the church, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Jesus is the head. We are the body. 
In 1 Corinthians 12, he put it this way. The body is a unit that's made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, it says here. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. There's not many churches. There's one church connected to Jesus. And when you turn to the book of Revelation in our text today, consider this, this picture. I mean, the book of Revelation has these magnificent, powerful images. Some of them really scary. But if you understand them, they give great comfort. There's this picture of, of a scroll with the seven seals. And the, the, the scroll represents Earth's history. But no one is found worthy to break the seals and open the book. In other words, no one is found worthy to bring history to its completion. You know, we know the Lord Jesus now is the, the Lord of history, don't we? The Bible tells us when all things are completed, that is, when he has brought history to its end, he will hand the kingdom completed back to the Father. Okay, that's his mission. He is Lord of history. And so we get this picture of Jesus. He's the only one worthy of breaking the seals of the scroll to, to take earth's history in his hands and to bring it to its conclusion, to, to reign over history. He's the only one. And as he comes forward, and as the lamb breaks the, 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 the seals, then heaven erupts in praise. And it, it speaks of the worthiness of the lamb. He alone is worthy to break the seals of the book. Why? Listen to what it says. With your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. See again this connection to Jesus? Why is the, the lamb worthy to break the, the, the seals? Because you purchased people for God. And you have made them many kingdoms. No, you have made them a kingdom, singular. You have made them a kingdom. And they will reign upon the earth. So when we take a look at our text this morning, and it was written to people in, in Asia Minor, the seven churches that were being persecuted and were being tempted to put aside Christ because Caesar looked greater. The whole book of Revelation is about the fact Jesus is greater than Caesar. That's what the church needed to remember in Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. Jesus breaks the seals. He alone is worthy because he purchased men for God from, from what? From every tribe and language and people and nation. In Jesus, the church is not confined to one race or one country or even one period of time, as we'll see. And so in our song that we sang, Speak, O Lord, remember what we sang? And by grace will stand on your promises and by faith, Remember the faith that the Spirit gives? And by faith we'll walk as you walk with us. Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. What is the church? It's the company of believers that Jesus is building. That Jesus is building. So that's the first thing we needed to see. The church is united to Christ, those who believe in him through the power of the Spirit. But let's also look at the church in terms of, well, time, culture, race, language, nation. As we saw from Revelation 5.9, you purchase men for God from every tribe, language, people and nation. So what does the confession say? So this holy church is not conf confined, bound or limited to a certain place or certain persons, but it is spread and dispersed throughout the entire world, though still joined and united in one heart and will, in one and the same spirit, by the power of faith. In the church, there is no place for racism. 
in the church, there's no place for nationalism. The church in Jesus Christ is one church. Within the church, there are no boundaries with regard to culture. There are no boundaries with regard to race, colour, language. In the church, there is just one gathering, one gathering that's united to Jesus. And it's not just from the time of Jesus to the end of time, it's from Adam through to the end of time. The church of Jesus goes across all ages from creation to the end. Do you remember the promise that God made to Abraham? Do you remember how God called him? This is the beginning of the separation of people from the world. This is the beginning of Israel, and from Israel comes the Christ. God calls him out one night, the stars are all there, and he makes a promise to him. Take a look at the stars of the sky. Take a look at the sand. Consider these things. This is before he has even one child. This is when he says, as the stars are in the sky, if you were to be able to count them, so would the number of your descendants be. Take a look at the sand. There's the sand on the seashore. If you're able to number the individual grains of sand, so will be the number of your, of, of your children. Was that ever and will it ever be realized? You see, in that passage, we already have a promise with regard to the church way back in time as to a, a church without boundaries. When you take a look at the book of Revelation, what does it describe in Revelation 7, 9 to 10? It describes what was promised to Abraham. Okay, remember that multitude that couldn't be numbered? It says here, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. What the, that was the whole point of showing the stars and getting Abraham to think of the seashore. Okay? His descendants wouldn't be able to be counted. I looked, and there was before me a great multitude that no one could count. And where did they come from, this multitude? from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now we've got a song that's called Salvation Belongs to Our God. This is the verse it comes from. But take a look at the picture of the church. It's the picture given to Abraham. When we see this for real in heaven, we're going to see the fulfillment of what was promised to Adam, uh, Abraham, which gives us the picture of the church that goes from creation to the end of time. All those who have believed in God for their salvation. A church that spans all ages of earth's history, from all walks of life, from all dialects, from all customs. One big church. Their unity has nothing to do with their culture. Their unity has got nothing to do with their race. Their unity has got no, nothing to do with where they were, they were brought up. Their unity is in Christ alone. Remember what Jesus prayed? I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. And I in them and you in me May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. How great is the church. How awesome. Now we look at denominations, Baptist, Reformed, Anglican, Uniting, Pentecostal, whatever. We think in terms of divisions. Jesus looks at the church. Do you reckon he sees denominations? No. Do you think he sees many brides? Many churches? No. Jesus looks at the church. He sees one bride. One people. You know, I, I love the imagery that when at the end of time we sit down as the church... Um, 
having cast our, our crowns before the throne, there will be Adam, and there will be Abraham, and there will be David, and there will be Martin Luther, and, and there will be John Calvin, and, and so many others, and there will be you and I in Christ, all sitting down together, one church. And so what you and I have to understand is the perception of the church that we have, we need to make sure it's the Bible's perception, that it's not governed by what we see with our eyes or what we experience like today in a little gathering here in this hall. The church has, through God's grace, always been gathered together by His Spirit. The church has always, from the beginning of time, been a product of God's workmanship. Elijah forgot that. Elijah forgot that the church can never be snuffed out because God's the builder. Do you remember what happened to Elijah? He had this great contest with regard to the prophets of Baal. On Mount Carmel, he slaughtered 400 of the prophets. And then Queen Jezebel wants to kill him. And because of one person wanting to kill him, he takes off. He's just won this enormous battle, this spiritual battle. And he's threatened by one woman and he takes off. And he, he, he comes to this place in the desert at the tamarind tree and he sits down there and he's exhausted. And eventually after rest and God's, God feeds him, God takes him up into the mountains. And there God says, just come here into the cleft of the rock and I'm going to pass by. And eventually he has this experience of God. And when we read of this, we, we hear that when he hears this small gentle wind, and he, he has this sense that this, this is just not a wind, this is God. And we read, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face. And he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And now listen to his perception. Listen to his perception of the people of God. I am the only one left. That was his perception. I am the only one left and now they're trying to kill me too. What was the reality? His perception was way out. What was the reality? God pronounces judgment on Israel and says what's going to happen to them and then he says this, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bound down to Baal, all those mouths who have not kissed him. Elijah thought he was the only one left. But there were 7,000 others he didn't know about. At times, it may appear as though the church is ready to be snuffed out, that we are powerless, that we are weak. Remember what Jesus said, that not even the gates of hell can, can stand against it? Think of the great empires, the Assyrian Empire. Think of the Greek Empire. Think of the Roman Empire. Guess what? You and I can go around the world, well, probably not at the moment, <laughs> but eventually one day, Lord willing, when this uh, disease comes under control, and we can go and visit the ruins of these empires. Some of them set out to destroy the people of God. They had that law to destroy the people of God. What can the church do today? The church can go and visit the ruins. The church continues on. It has never been snuffed out. Remember what the confession said. And this holy church is preserved by God against the rage of the whole world even though for a time it may appear very small in the eyes of men, as though it were snuffed out. So what's your perception of the church? What's mine? How, how did it stack up with what I've just shared with you this morning? Let's understand the church is the gathering of God's people gathered through Jesus Christ, given faith, those given faith by the Holy Spirit, those taken out from the whole world, across all cultures, languages, nations and times. 
and the church will ever remain. That's an image of power, isn't it? It's an image of endurance, but only because of God's faithfulness. And so we're going to uh, uh, sing a song in a moment that speaks beautifully of this. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. The church is yet to go through many trials. And yet our future is secure. Because Christ has an inheritance that the Father has promised. And he, through the Spirit, is gathering that inheritance in. And what is the inheritance? It's the church. People gathered from many nations. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we give you thanks. And we ask that you'll forgive us when our perception of the church is so way, way out of whack with regard to the reality that is revealed to us in your word. We thank you, Lord, that the reality is that your church today, your people, can go to the Middle East and can visit the ruins of, of great empires, whether it be the Egyptian or Roman or Greek or, or Assyrian, Babylonian, whatever, Lord, we, we thank you that as these empires have passed away and their is history has come to an end, indeed, we, we declare it to be ancient history. Yet, Father, your church has a continuing history which has not come to a conclusion that the church will ever remain and will be there when Jesus brings history to its end, having broken the seals of the book, that indeed, Father, one day he will return and declare the world's history to be ended, that the kingdom has been built and will be hand uh, handed over complete to you. And so, Lord, help us to have that image of the church, a people gathered from all ages, all nations, languages, cultures, a church without boundaries, a church united in Christ alone. And help us then to be filled with confidence, to be filled also, Lord, with courage in the knowledge that your church cannot and will not fail. And therefore, Lord, we pray, help us to continue to go on, even as we sang, stand up for stand up for Jesus, to, to march, Lord, together with all the saints of the past and the present and the future. Help us, Lord, as one body to march forward in, in Jesus, holding high his banner, knowing indeed, Father, that the future in him is secure. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.